Welcome to Creator Talks. I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. On today's show, my guests, Pornsack, Pitachote, and Aaron Campbell, here to talk about their series being published through Image Comics, Infidel. It's a five-part series. The first issue came out on March 14th, and the next one is coming out on April 18th with a David Mack variant cover. A former editor at Vertigo Comics, this is Pornsack's first comic that he's written, and Aaron Campbell has done a lot of work for Dynamite and other publishers, and the colorist and editor on the book is Jose Villarubia, and this is the first comic book that he is editing. So there are a lot of firsts here. Pornsack and Aaron and I talk about the comic book, the creative process behind it. We also talk about how they got where they are, not just professionally, but geographically. Aaron talks about how this project, working with Jose, lifted his spirit and brought back the passion and desire to work in comics. And on this episode, we go through my rest and relaxation questions that have been expanded. And Pornsack and Aaron had a great time with them. This is a great episode of Creator Talks. They were wonderful guests. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll think about a lot of things they talk about. I think this is a great example of what I want Creator Talks to be. A conversation with creators, not just about their work, but about them. Their view of life, their view of work, and what really fires their passion to do what they do. So let's begin my interview with Pornsack, Pintachote, and Aaron Campbell on their new series, Infidel. Here now, on Creator Talks. Pornsack and Aaron, welcome to Creative Talks. Thank hey, you. Pornsack, I'll start with you. I saw you did not like talking about yourself. I'll try to help you out, make it easy for you. <laughs> now, are you currently in L.A.? I am currently in L.A. right now. I moved out here about six years ago. I lived in New York when I was at D.C. I was an editor at D.C. Vertigo for about seven years. And then I was invited out here to be part of D.C.'s media team. And I have been out here for going on... God, I want to say it's been like six years since then. And I've been desperately trying to get back to New York ever since. <laughs> <laughs> really? Do you prefer New York? Yeah, where are you out of curiosity? I am out of Wilmington, Delaware. Okay, okay. About three hours from New York. So. Yeah, yeah, I knew you were East Coast. You know, I love New York so much. I was born in New York, moved around a lot, and then lived there for 12 years before coming out to L.A. with the D.C. job. And yeah, I mean, and now I do writing for the comics and then writing for some other like digital series and TV and blah, 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 blah. Um, so I kind of have to be here, but I'm like trying to figure out my like ultimate dream is to find some way to like at the very least do the bi-coastal thing and live in both. I just want to be in New York <laughs> more regularly, so desperately. Aaron has heard me talk about this on so many interviews, and yeah. I'm sure he's sick of it by now. <laughs> you know, I would love to move to the West Coast, to the Southwest, and my fear like, to do that for work or something like that. I've always mentioned that at work, and my fear is that I'll get out there and then I'll be like, oh. Well, we don't need you. And then I'm like, now what? Now what do I do? That's my biggest fear. <laughs> I believe that. I totally believe that. I, I kind of had that fear too when I moved out here. I just, I don't know. I miss like living in the city. Everything's so spread out over here. You know, it's so funny. Like I feel like when uh, tourists come to New York, they all like everything here is so tall. And whenever I leave New York, I'm like everything here is so wide. I don't <laughs> Since you were let go from vertigo a riff you've had to reinvent yourself in a way because you were an editor and you were directing films and what's it like now to change from being an editor to being a writer of your own series how are you adjusting to that it's funny because i kind of feel like i've had a couple of you know adjustments you know ever since moving to dc the things have kind of been like sort of a steady adjustment to things so first there was at vertigo and then there was sort of getting that promotion that led me from Vertigo to out here to work with DC on the West Coast. And then after doing that, it was leaving DC a couple of years ago to work on my own comic. So it's been kind of constant sort of reinvention. I don't know. I kind of feel like that's part of the creative industry. It's constantly like sort of changing. Like even when I was at Vertigo, like I would try for the books to be very different. I've always kind of liked to have sort of different experiences in terms of that and like to not be repetitive with the whole thing. In terms of like... Switching from being an editor to writer, there's a couple differences there. Creatively, the difference is, in a weird way, you, you kind of have to like let go of the editing impulse while you're writing. There's um, Robert Rodriguez has this whole idea about like the inner editor. For him, it's just like 
Robert Rodriguez writes better in the morning because when he writes in the morning, his inner editor hasn't woken up yet. So he gets a whole bunch out on the page and then his inner editor wakes up and is like, all right, let's deal with all this. Like I used to be a night writer. I would just not be productive for a very long time. And then like midnight would hit around and my inner editor would get too tired to stop me. And then I would just like vomit on the page. And the next morning, I, my, my inner editor would be like, oh, let's see what you did while it was, while it was gone. So, um, <laughs> so a lot of it for me is like trying to get out of your own way when you're writing and not having that editing voice say like you know we're gonna shut this down uh and just letting yourself kind of play a little bit that's the biggest difference from the from being an editor to a writer and then because i had this other thing in between where i was sort of at dc at a different capacity as a freelancer and being sort of an employee in a thing it's a little bit of the self-starting of it all how to structure your day i'm a lot more aggressive about making plans since becoming a freelancer because if i don't make plans i don't see people and then I start to go like crazy and I start to just work under that 100% of the time. That I thought was fascinating too. Um, after I left the DC, the West Coast side of DC, I met a guy who was a director at Disney and he actually worked on like the let it go portion of the Frozen, uh, the Frozen movie. So he was used to this very busy job and he would get like hundreds of emails a day. And, and, and when I was at DC, I had one of those jobs too. I was running the TV department and I would get like literally somewhere between like two to 300 emails a day just dealing with that stuff. And he gave me this great advice, which I still haven't taken, but it's still great advice, it, and which was, okay, whatever you do, find a co-working space, find like a coffee shop to work and find anything. Because when you're working in an environment that has that much stimulus and you change it that drastically, your body gets depressed because you're not used to the lack of chemical stimulus. There's nothing to stimulate you and you're used to so, so much stimulus. So just get out there and see things and see people and have people around you. Because even if things are going well, you will get depressed and you will not know why. And it's literally because your body is dealing with less stimulus than it's used to. And even though I didn't get the co-working space, I do try to make it like anytime I edit, I try to be outdoors when I edit. I can't write outdoors, self-editing and all that kind of stuff. I try to do outdoors as much just to get some stimulus because I thought that was really great advice. That's a very long winded rambling uh, way to answer your question though so <laughs> that is very good advice because i find the same thing when i want to do show prep or write something uh like a, some kind of recommended reading i'll go out to a coffee shop or i'll go out to a pub and i'll start writing there because the stimulus around me and then like you i have that editor off while i'm writing and then i come home the next day and I look at it and i go what did you drink i mean <laughs> clean, that, <laughs> clean that up <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> but it's good to be unfiltered that way take the brakes off create and step back put on the other hat and then look at it critically or i go to my wife and she'll look at it critically but uh yeah i need to have the brakes off and be around people it's, it's necessary it's just like that for your mental health and it's one of those things that like you know i only learned uh, you only realize it going from sort of like the more corporate gig to the uh freelance gig now aaron i want to ask you I understand you became tired of the East Coast eventually. I can't believe it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you moved to where you had family in New Mexico. Yes. Are you still in New Mexico? Yeah. Lived here for 12 years now. 13. No, 13 actually next month. Wow. So longest I've ever lived anywhere. And yeah, I'm like just to kind of frame that exodus from the East Coast. You know, I'm originally a Midwesterner. I'm from Missouri. I was born and, you know, spent my first years in southeast Missouri, where all my family's from, moved up to St. Louis. And then, you know, my family, I kind of got into this because of what my dad did for work, sort of got into this habit of moving every few years. And so we moved around a lot. And that became a big aspect of my early childhood development, A, we moved a lot from house to house just because they like to move a lot. Um, and so we moved around like in the St. Louis area quite a bit just from new houses, new houses as my, you know, as my father became more established in his career, you know, they kind of upgraded their homes. And then we ended up in New Hampshire for three years when I was a kid. My dad was a project manager for an electrical contractor. And so he did big jobs all over the country. And if those jobs were long, we would just pack everything up and move. And so spent three years in New Hampshire. I remember spending the summer in New Orleans. My dad was in Kentucky for a while. So we were kind of all over the place. And so that kind of became part of who I was early on. And so when I went to college, um, I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. Um, after that was done, I was kind of 
you know, I lived in the heart of Baltimore. And so I was really overloaded by that city and I had to get out. I immediately moved back to St. Louis for a year, took a year off and then ended up going back to grad school. And I went to grad school in New York City at the School of Visual Arts. And so I lived in New York for two years and unlike porn sack, like it, <laughs> New York never really grew on me <laughs> to the point where like literally the day I graduated, my parents moved me back down to Baltimore. One of my best friends from undergrad and I became roommates. Like I just had to get out of the city. It was too claustrophobic for me. Uh, and I, I, you know, I've always had a car. I've always been able to kind of just like if I wanted to, I could hop in my car and I could drive. This was me like in Baltimore when I was going to undergrad, you know, like on the weekends, if I was feeling overwhelmed by Baltimore, I could hop in my car and I could be to Gettysburg in an hour if I wanted to, or I could go out to Antietam because I, you know, I was, I'm a big history buff, but I could go anywhere. I could go on hikes. You know, my dad and I, we used to go to Shenandoah a lot and do a lot of hiking so I could get out. But in New York, that was never a possibility. So for two years, I was kind of like trapped inside this concrete cage as I came <laughs> to kind of term it. And, uh, and so I was like, I just, I got to get out. And even though like there is an aspect of me, like whenever I go back to New York and it's been a long time, there is a certain aspect of me that that really loves it. And I, I really love it if I can take it in small doses. But <laughs> after grad school, I moved back down to Baltimore. And I was there for two years, and I was just kind of existing. I was bartending, and I was kind of trying to make headway as a fantasy book illustrator, not really kind of getting anywhere. And, you know, my friends, you know, we were all starting to get older as we approached our mid to late 20s, people were getting married, even starting to have children. And so that whole friend group that I had there was just slowly drifting away. And I just realized, like, there's not really a future here for me that I can conceive of. It's becoming a little toxic for me. Like, I'm not really doing the work that I feel like I should be doing. And my family was all in New Mexico at this point. So that's 2,000 miles of distance. So at best, I would see them twice a year, but typically once a year at Christmas. And uh, so finally, I just kind of one day, I just said to myself, I'm moving to New Mexico. I'm going to I need to be close to my family. I had nieces and nephews and all this aspect of life that I was missing. And so moved out here and I love it. I've always loved New Mexico and I've lived here now longer than I've ever lived anywhere continuously in my life. We love it out there. We went out there in 2010 before the kids were born, flew into Albuquerque, went to Santa Fe, went through Taos, went to Bandolera National Park, had a great time out there. All we great love, stuff. Love it out there. <laughs> and I just want to go back. You used to hike in Shenandoah a lot. We do that too. Like every couple of years we go to Shenandoah. Have you ever hiked Old Rag? Old Rag. Which one was that? Where is that located in the Shenandoah range? I think it is further south. My dad and I used to pick up the trail further north along the range. Mm -hmm. It's been so long that I can't remember like the, the closest towns, but I know that it was the further northern area of Shenandoah that we used to go to. Yeah, Old Ragged, we, we would go out there. We hiked it a couple times, and I remember we would always pass this antique store that had a sign out front. It's still there to this day. It says, Antiques Made Daily. <laughs> wow, honest, honest awesome. God, honest that's to God. That's awesome. <laughs> and the first time we hiked Old Ragged, it had rained the night before. So we were insane. We hiked this thing. We're slipping and sliding. And then like idiots, we go back down the same way we went up. Where we could have oh, gone, there's, yeah. there's an easier way down. <laughs> and that's the thing, like, like it's deceptive, like how difficult <laughs> the Shenandoah, like the Appalachians, how difficult the Appalachians are in general, because it's very low elevation. Um, it's several thousand feet lower than where I'm here at in my home right now in Albuquerque. But they're like teeth that you have to like climb up and down every one straight up and then straight back down. Is these humps, continuous humps. <laughs> Those were grueling, but like really rewarding days. It's been a long time since I've thought about that. I don't get out into the wilderness so much anymore, oddly, now that I'm <laughs> surrounded by nothing but vast open spaces. <laughs> I first saw your work when you did for Dynamite Dark Shadows. Oh, that was the first one that you yeah, saw? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I liked it. I mean, I did read Green Hornet Year One, and I did read Uncanny that you did with Andy Diggle. That was very good, too. Ooh. I liked it very much. But uh, Dark Shadows, it never rose above that level that you said it at in the first arc. I mean, it was. I read the whole thing. I mean, I stayed on the series and read the whole thing. But yeah, those I, first I, few I, issues, I really liked them. Thank you. It's funny. I have sort of a love-hate relationship with those three issues that I did. Because um, I didn't even finish the arc. Garth Ennis, uh, they were working on the Garth Ennis shadow, and they switched me over to that. And they had a fill-in artist do the final issue of that first four-issue arc. The first three issues, you know, when I agreed to do that, I did so not because I had any love for the original soap opera. Because that was so... I, I didn't exist when that was a soap opera. <laughs> so, and, and I had no memory of it. I'd never seen it. You know, I grew up before Netflix and the internet, so there was no way to have any exposure to that. But I always remembered very fondly the attempted uh, reboot of Dark Shadow that I think NBC did oh, um, wow. in 19, yeah, 1991 or 92, basically around the same time period as Northern Exposure. Um, but it, it starred Ben Cross as Barnabas Collins. And Ben Cross is an incredible actor who is completely underplayed. I mean, he's Spock's father and like perfect casting of him. And I, I loved it. It was something that kind of existed in the back of my memory for years and years and years. And I remember even telling my wife about it long before Dynamite got Dark Shadows as a property. And then there was this very brief moment for maybe a year um, that Netflix had that reboot up. And we watched it, and it was just as good as I remembered it. Like, it's one of those few times where I was like, this is absolutely worth going back and revisiting. It's not just nostalgia. It was actually, as far as I'm concerned, great. And so when I agreed to do that book, I specifically asked... Right up front. Is this going to be connected to the original soap opera or is this a reboot? Is this something where I, I am going to have the opportunity to redesign all the characters anew and I'm not going to be beholden to that old stuff? And they were like, absolutely. This is all new. You can design all the characters. And I was like, awesome. This is going to be super fun. And then they hired the author and I can't remember his name because he's not actually a comic book author. The guy that they ended up hiring to write the series was billed as the world's foremost authority on Dark Shadows uh, soap <laughs> opera. Wow. And uh, what ended up happening was it basically issue one of the Dark Shadows comic series was basically episode 1530 whatever <laughs> it was you know whatever episode they finished that they, they ended the show with this was basically the next episode and that's wow. how it was described to me by the author and it got to a point where like i couldn't really work with him anymore like i told my editor you need to handle all communications because the feedback that he's giving me like i'm gonna lose my mind because huh. it was stuff like this looks really great but the shape of the light bulbs in the candelabra are less of a tear shape and more of a pear <laughs> shape, you know? And, wow. and it was like, that was the whole thing. And I was like, I'm not, no, no, no. <laughs> and so was, was like, there an I, audience for a comic like that, like, is, is there enough of a dark shadow audience to justify that kind of obsessiveness in his mind, I guess, future episode of dark shadows is like that. Like, was there like, how well did the book do? I'm so curious. Like, I think it was probably the lowest release of any book I worked on at Dynamite. I, I know The Shadow, obviously, was the highest release, right. but that was definitely the lowest, and I'm pretty sure it didn't last too long after I left the book. Here's the weird thing. This is why I say I have a love-hate relationship with it. There is such a rabid, devout fan base for the old Dark Shadows um, soap opera. I mean, they uh -huh. have these specialized conventions, I think, in providence rhode island or okay. that might be the lovecraft one but anyway there's there is a specific convention just for the dark shadows uh soap opera these are all people who for the most part are in their probably their 50s 60s and even 70s they have very established lives and they have money to throw around 
And so mm. I ended up, I think I have maybe five of those pages left. Oh, wow. So I, I sold more original art from that series than I think I have on any other book I've ever worked. Wow. And so, like, that made up for it. I was like, holy crap. <laughs> I made a lot of money off of that series just from those original art sales. It was really weird. I was like, this was a very kind of oppressive thing to work on, but at the same time, it was, like, incredibly fruitful. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, since we're talking about horror, and we can start to segue into Infidel now, Aaron, for a while, you were concerned about doing a creator-owned work because you have to eat. You need some place to live. And mm -hmm. you didn't want to have yes. to wait so long to get paid. What changed when you and Pornsack got together to do this series published through Image? Because Pornsack has that sweet, sweet DC entertainment <laughs> money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, Pornsack is, is an incredibly uh, equitable individual who wanted to make sure that, you know, everybody who's working on this project was getting what they deserve. And he's paying me a, a page rate up, up front. Pornsack's recouping his investment off the front. But then ultimately, Pornsack and I share... Uh, ownership along with the rest of the creative team. It was really the perfect moment because what I've said for so many years is creator owned is either a young kid's game or an old guy's game. You know, <laughs> like it, there's not a lot of possibility in between unless you are independently wealthy or you have like a, an incredible like support system, like a spouse who can support you during that process. Like imagine like, cause like Mitch Gerads, like, you know, he started off with the activity, but man, like Mitch was like a young guy when he was working on the activity. I, I've never really sat down. I've, I've always wanted to kind of pick Mitch's brain and find out exactly how he was able to make that work in the beginning. But, you know, I have my ideas about maybe how, but I know like I can imagine for a lot of young artists, who get a creator-owned book, you know, they're young enough that they can still, like, live at home with mom and dad, you know, not have to worry about rent and things like that, and so they can make it through that. Or just because they're young enough, they don't have all of the responsibilities of life that have kind of slowly, like, stacked up, you know, like little Legos. And then you have people in the heyday of their career, like Kurt Busiek or Ed Brubaker and people like that, who have such a backlog of work that they've created that they're getting residuals on that they they can go and they can do that stuff. They have the freedom. But like for me, like I'm kind of in the middle. There's been opportunities before, but I could just never really see like, how can I pay my mortgage? It's not going to work. And I can't take that nine months. I can't even express like on how many different levels, not just because I'm getting a livable page rate from Pornsack, but on how many other levels that this project was absolutely the perfect thing at the perfect time. Now, this book, it's a classic haunted house story updated for the 21st century. You write about not only things that go bump and slither in the night, but also about a real horror today, xenophobia. Porn sack, why did you decide to start there, addressing that issue with your very first comic book? The genesis of the story happened, I want to say, like eight or nine years ago, back when Obama was still president. And we had licked racism because we now had a, a black president and we lived in a post-racial society. But at the same time, though, uh, Islamophobia was rampantly on the rise. So I had the idea for this story about connecting these two ideas and to talk about xenophobia and Islamophobia and race and all that kind of stuff in a way that I didn't feel like we were doing. The weird thing that happened was that, you know, I was working for DC. I couldn't do it as a comic. And so I just kind of kept it there. It's sort of these loose ideas that I had that would just work away on on the side. What eventually happened was the world just kind of became the world that we're living in now, where the themes about it were so relevant. And this conversation about race, the whole thesis of the story started at first, it started with this idea of like, we ha weren't having this conversation. Now we were kind of having it. And because we were having it, the themes of the story became really relevant. It was killing me to have this idea sit in a drawer. And because when I came up with it, I couldn't do it as a comic. I had thought like, oh, maybe I'll do it as a movie. Maybe I'll do it as this, as that. But it was the idea of doing it as a comic and specifically getting to dive into sort of like what makes a horror comic work and getting into the particular vernacular of comics and horror. That's when I got really excited about doing it as a comic book. So to me, it, I don't know if it was really just kind of like, what do I want my first comic book to be as much as I really want to do something in comics. I had this story that seemed so relevant. And I also feel like, too, 
more than anything else, like comics and politics, there is such a long history of them dating all the way back to editorial cartoons. And probably because in terms of a visual medium, you can make the argument if you're a cartoonist, it's the purest expression, you know, because like in film and TV and any other medium, there is so much collaboration and it takes so much money that things can get watered down. But I actually feel like this story could have only been told in comics. Um, only comics would have given it the freedom to sort of be what it is. And also, too, and once it was in comics, it was sort of taking that opportunity to really lean into sort of what makes a comic a comic and how to do that. I mean, I kind of want every comic I work on, you know, I, to me, the worst insult you can give a comic is like a movie pitch on paper. Like, I hate that, you know? Um, it drives me nuts when people say that. Well, living in L.A., too, you get a lot of people who are very obviously just want to take their rejected ideas and turn them into comics in the hopes that someone will pay attention to it now because it's a comic. And I hate that. It drives me up the wall. So the idea of like having a story that felt like it, it could work in comics and then getting the opportunity to do everything I could to make it intrinsic to comics. Certainly back when I was at Vertigo, I would tell the guys, it was a secret that, you know, quote unquote secret, I would tell the guys like, yes, we want all this stuff to be adapted and blah, blah, blah. But like the goal is to make a comic that every other medium kind of looks at and envies and says, oh, I wish I could make a movie, a TV show, a play, a whatever, a novel that was as good as that comic, but we can't because that comic is so unique to that comic. So it wasn't really like, this should be my first comic. It was just like, I really wanted to work on comics. I had this idea and it's just merging those two impulses. Oh, I commend you so much for that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I really appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> no, no, thank, thank you for reading. I thank you for being interested. <laughs> You've assembled quite a team. Your colorist, Jose yeah. Villarubia is on the book. Definitely one of the best out there for sure. He's also your editor. First editing job. It is. What happened with Jose was I worked with Jose a lot when I was at Vertigo. And my favorite game to play with Jose whenever I got a book, because we got, became really good friends, was I would get a book, you know, a green light for a book. And I'd call Jose and be like, these are all the artists I'm thinking about for this book. And he would give me his recommendations based on the pitch and all that sort of stuff that I would tell him over the phone of all these other artists to look at for the book. And, and he's just got such a wide vocabulary of artists. You know, he knows all these like European indie artists, but he also is like up on like all your wild storm stuff. Like he just knows so many different types of artists. And I would always joke with him that, you know, Jose, you're like a closeted editor. And, um, and so when I got the idea of doing this book and I really wanted to do this book, my first call was to Jose. We, you know, we're going to play the game. And at this point, it's been years since I talked to Jose. Um, so much of doing this comic has been the excuse to talk to old friends for a while. Like, I just miss talking to comics folks. I'd see them at conventions and all that, but it's still not the same. And talking about it with him, he was just like, Pornsack, as you know, I am a closeted editor and I would really love to edit this book. And I was just kind of blown away. It wasn't what I was expecting in a million years. I thought, that's, kind of, that's awesome. I'm known as an editor. I, my first work is a writer. Jose's known as a colorist. His first work is an editor. I liked the idea that we had skin in the game and wanted to prove ourselves in that way. So it just really made sense. And, you know, and it's a chance to work with a friend. So Aaron, what was your reaction when you had a chance to work on this book after working on so many noir books? Now's your chance to do a, a real horror story. Pretty much a dream come true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've said it a lot at this point. Horror has always been a deep passion of mine. I've always sort of toyed around with the horror genre all through, you know, my education and development as uh, an illustrator. Professionally, Dark Shadows, for instance, I began to kind of do some little experimentation stuff, but, you know, wasn't really there yet. And, you know, there was obviously restrictions with the uh, content that kept it from really going like off the deep end, like where I wanted to go. It was really incredible. I was on board from I mean, the moment that Jose contacted me, I was ready and willing to jump in. Uh, you know, Jose, um, he was a professor of art at the Maryland Institute College of Art, where I went to undergrad. He was just beginning his career there when I was an undergrad. Even though I never had Jose as a professor, we all knew who he was. And he would come in and do critiques and talks in, in our classes. And we were all utterly enamored by him from the moment he entered the classroom. He has an incredible presence and an understanding of art that is vast, you know, and then he was also beginning his work as a colorist. He jumped right into the deep end with Vertigo. I, I know that Jose probably did some small things or I know he has some stuff, but like where I really like learned who Jose was uh, on his work for a book called Veils, written and created by another one of our professors at MICA named Stephen John Phillips. 
Stephen John, he had done a lot of covers for Vertigo. He was sort of in the vein of like Dave McKean. He did a lot of photographic work. Um, so he did covers for like Chiaroscuro and things like that. And then he got this contract to do this big like 96 page hardcover graphic novel called Veils. Stephen didn't quite understand, I think at the time, like how much work it was going to entail. And so he brought Jose in to help him with backgrounds and color and everything like that. I think at that point he had already been working with Jay Lee on Hellshock. We were all like absolutely enthralled by Jose. And so, you know, after graduating from college, I really had no contact with Jose for a long time. And then I went to Baltimore Comic Con maybe like uh, nine years ago or so and ran into him there and kind of reintroduced who I was. He kind of vaguely remembered, and we just kind of became kind of fast friends from there on. Every once in a while, I would reach out to Jose, and like, I'm starting a new book at Dynamite, and they're asking me, like, if I have any ideas for colorists, and you're the guy (laughs) that I want. And Jose's like, I would love to. I would absolutely love to, but I don't know if Dynamite can afford me. And he's like, find out. Here's my, like, low end on my page rate. And I was like, oh, man. Like, yeah, they're not going to hire you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, I'm going to ask it anyway, and I'm going to try my damnedest. But, yeah, no dice. We can never really get there. And so with this opportunity, I was like, finally. Again, this is another one of those aspects where I'm talking about how perfect it was on every level. I mean, this is Jose. This is somebody who I have looked up to as a, not necessarily as a mentor, but as like a role model for so long. Finally, getting that opportunity to work with him was just a dream come true. I didn't know who Pornsack was at the time. I knew the books that he had edited on, but I, I was never one of those illustrators who paid a lot of attention to anyone other than the artist and then the writer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, But once I learned who Pornsack was and we started talking, it was just all kismet. I mean, it just all perfectly made sense. Well, let me ask you about the unsung member often of a team, the letterer and designer, Jeff Powell. He worked on the design of the book. Pornsack, what exactly did he contribute to the book? And did you go through many different designs before you said, ah, yes, that's the one I want? I really love working with Jeff. Jeff has done a bunch of stuff. Uh, probably his highest profile thing is, are those like big, oversized, deadly class that just will suck your money away because they look so beautiful that you have to own them, even though you already have the single issues and the trades and, and all that kind of stuff. He's so good. And I've seen his stuff on a bunch of different projects. I What I really liked about him He's got a very clean, minimalist style. He knows production. He can handle a lot. In terms of sort of like how long did it take, I honestly don't want to think it took very long. He did a couple. I'm in love with the logo for Infidel. When he sent in the logo, it was like four or five uh, options. It's one of the very first options. Kind of nailed it right off the bat. For a while, he said, I want to go in and fuss with it a little bit more. I want to go in and fuss with it more. And when he finally did, we're just like, no, I think you got it the first time around. Like, it was just so totally nailed it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, the design of the book, one, he's so great. He's just got such a great aesthetic. I also think, too, that this talent that he has that I was not expecting one of the things that we're doing in the back covers of every book, uh, every issue, is sort of these like little teasers, just a couple panels from the comic. I know nothing about music, and as I try to speak in musical terms, this will become very obvious. In the same way, like a record single, you know, looks like a full record for an entire album, but just smaller, and as a result, it feels frailer and feels more special because of that. I'd always wanted a comic to sort of look like that. And so as a result, like that's why the back cover designs got all sort of our blurbs. And normally in a book, you would have the synopsis of the book there. But because it's a comic, we kind of want it to be a comics way of synopsizing the book. We pull out panels from the comic themselves, and Jeff does all of that. And we just got the proof for the second issue in. And he has such a great talent of just distilling, like, the best part of the book or, like, the core, you know, concept of the book by finding just the right panels to do it in a way that I absolutely can't. He's got just a great sort of sense of design. And I just love that it's very clean. It's very modern. He's been throwing a lot of covers on this book. We've kind of like gone crazy. And and we're just like, here you go, Jeff. You know, working a logo. And and, and, and he always manages to do it. I really love working. And he's like the most reliable guy in the world. Can't say enough good things about him. I really can't. I'm glad you pointed that out. That back cover design. I'm looking at it right now. I'm holding on to it. It looks really nice. Turning it over, Aaron, these covers of yours... 
it gives you the creeps. It's really, I mean, how, why, how did you come up with that? Like, you know, the hand reaching behind the person and just that impending sense of doom. Man, that was one I didn't think too much about. I always found it difficult in school to do conceptual work. When I was going through school, all of my professors were from the editorial illustration world where everything is about the clever joke. Mm. And the weird little twist, you know, wor- like visual wordplay. I-, I just could never do it. I- I'm not really sure exactly why. And I always struggled so much. And then when I got into grad school, the chair of our department was this incredible horror illustrator or known for his horrific imagery, Marshall Arisman. He was a consultant on the movie Jacob's Ladder and... I mean, if you, if you just look up Marshall Ayers and you're going to see what I'm talking about. He was very influenced by Francis Bacon. I remember distinctly in his classes, he kind of demystified the whole process. He basically said, an incredibly well-executed piece is worth 10 clever ideas. If you can just distill the image down to the thing you want to draw and then put everything that you have into that, It doesn't matter if the concept is high or incredibly clever. And so I've always kind of held that with me. And so when it came to doing that first cover, this is a Muslim girl and the world is out to get her as well as the supernatural entities. So just do that. Have her and she's terrified. She's uncertain. And then there's this hand reaching out. She senses this thing coming for her but she she hasn't realized it yet and so like that's all i really wanted to capture was that aspect of the story and how the hijab that she wears is this sort of artificial barrier that racists use to separate themselves from the individual and a focus of attack that was the whole point is creating this boundary line between Aisha, this lovely, nice girl who's trying to live a good life and a fruitful life. And then this this intensity of hate and anger and just emotion coming from this thing. And then, of course, like there's a really simple reason why it's the hand, because we didn't want to show the ghosts, but we wanted to suggest the ghost. So I was like, well, what are you going to do to suggest the ghost? Like a good, creepy hand. Let's just draw a really cool, creepy <laughs> hand. You know, like, <laughs> and so that's actually the the hand that you see in the cover is the second hand I drew. The first hand wasn't quite creepy enough, and so then I went back and I redid it and just creeped it out even further with like the little like burnt fingertips. And an important lesson I think for a lot of illustrators, if you're having trouble with the concept, just focus on something simple and intimate, or or something that resonates with yourself. And then just execute the shit out of it. (laughs) And if you can do that, the concept's not that important at the end of the day. It's all about making the image impactful. On the interior, you're using a different style for the people in the book and the surroundings and the ghost. So it's more photorealistic as far as the faces of the people in there. And you're using more of a freehand type style for the ghost? So everything that's real life, Aisha, Medina, Leslie, Tom, anything that's happening in the real world is all digital. That's just because I started working digitally, I think, on Felix Leiter. I went 100% digital at that point, and I really enjoyed that. But I was missing the traditional. And so I was like, oh, what about this idea? What if we... Uh, we're going to shake things up and we do some mixed media, but like mixed media, digital, traditional. So the idea is that everything that's real life is digital. And then everything that's supernatural is all traditional media. So it's gouache, it's colored pencil, it's ink and bleach and splatters and all kinds of craziness. Uh, whatever I kind of like feel like, however I feel like experimenting. In Porn Sack and Jose and I had a lot of conceptual talks about this before I ever even jumped into it, um, where I kind of pitched the idea. There is this boundary that exists between ideologies where you have xenophobia and jingoism and hate and rage and bigotry and racism that exists over here on this side. And then you have the truth of 
these people on the other side. And that xenophobia, well, and actually it's, all of that is actually the boundary. You have like two classes of people. You have these people over here on this side who have these ideas that, you know, express the xenophobia and, and whatever, racism and things. And then you have this other group on this side. And the boundary line that separates them is the xenophobia, it is the racism. That's the thing that stops fruitful connection between individuals is implicit bias and ignorance and unwillingness of individuals to empathize with other people. And so that was the idea. I was like, the idea here is that ephemeral, non-existent boundary between the traditional media and the digital media is the line of xenophobia, the thing that keeps the two from ever meeting in a useful way. The only interaction you can then have with this stalwart line, this red line in the sand, is violence and anger and hate and misunderstanding. And so that was sort of the idea that I was playing with. Um, and we didn't know how it was going to work out in the beginning. And I, again, this is another one of those perfect things about this project where Jose and Pornsack had a lot of faith in my ideas and allowed me to make that exploration. Now that we're getting like all of these amazing reviews, like finally I can kind of breathe a sigh of relief because it's, it's worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Hornsack, anything else you want to add about the book that people who haven't picked it up yet should know? Uh, I think a lot of people, because of the topic matter, people kind of expect it to have like this political agenda. For us, the, the main goal really is to tell a terrifying horror comic around things that have become politicized. That is probably the biggest thing, uh, you know, if people are coming in with a bias, is that, you know, it's not sort of a political agenda book, probably, primarily because I don't think those books kind of work. I don't think those stories sort of work when you start with a story that's trying to tell you something about something. And it's been very grateful to read all the reviews uh, who might have come in sort of thinking like, oh, I thought it was this one thing, but actually, no, it's a horror story. It is a horror story that wants to talk about real things that is set in a world that's a lot like ours, where, you know, xenophobia and racism and Islamophobia are just as present in that world as it is in our world, and it doesn't attempt to ignore it. But it's not a real story with a political agenda. And that is kind of the, the thing that I, you know, the, the biggest political agenda is that people are people, I guess, in the story. <laughs> but in, beyond that, there isn't that agenda. I feel like if there's anything, if anyone who hasn't heard about the story, who hasn't heard about the book, that is a big thing. I just want to tell them if they're looking for like a horror comic, a modern horror comic, because there's some great ones out there. There's some great ones out there. We wanted to make a horror comic that was as aggressively modern as possible. That's kind of what led to uh, this book. I like that term, aggressively modern. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a, it literally is a shadow that looms over me as I'm working. It's just kind of yeah. like... <laughs> that's, a great, that's like a great pull quote for the cover of the, <laughs> aggressively modern. <laughs> but but as it, it is this, I've been using the word aggressive a lot lately. I've been watching, uh, there's a freeform show called uh, Shadow Hunters. And I swear to God, the most aggressively attractive people that are on that show, like everyone on that show <laughs> is so beautiful. And it's just like the most beautiful people all interacting at once. And I, I'm watching the screen. It's just like there's so much beauty on the screen right now. It's amazing. Like it's amazing one of those people exists. But like all to have all of them existing at the same time on your screen at the same time, there's just too much pity happening here. <laughs> And I've been using the word aggressive to like, as a result, it describes so much. And it all comes from like watching the first season of Shadowhunters, being like, these people are aggressively attractive. I feel like assaulted by how attractive they are. <laughs> <laughs> now, Infidel is a five issue series. I won't ask if there's going to be more because that would spoil things. We don't <laughs> know yet. The <laughs> next issue, number two, is coming out April 18th. So people should get on board. And do you know if there's a second printing yet? Have you heard anything about that? We haven't heard anything yet, so we'll see. We know that there are not a ton of copies left going into the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, haven't heard anything beyond that, though. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that I heard that the Virgin, the artist oh, appreciation yeah. cover, was sold out. I would just like to say like how much of an honor it was for me to be picked to be one of those first four Virgin artist appreciation covers. And how honored I feel by Pornsack's quote on the back of that cover. 
um, <laughs> which I didn't even know about until I got my copies. And I oh, is that? And oh, I was like, cool. oh, that's, man. That's such a great way to find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, what? What is this? <laughs> the other three covers are like powerhouses of comics. That was really incredible. And at first, when they asked us, like, oh, yeah, we're doing this thing, uh, artist appreciation version covers, it's like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> uh, but then I find out that it's their first time ever doing it, and they only did four covers, and the other ones are like <laughs> Saga yeah. and Eduardo uh, Riso. Gideon Falls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good company. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's also one of those things, too, and I'm like, so much props for Image for doing this. When they come to you and say, like, yeah, we're going to do a version without the logo or any of the trade dress, you're like, okay, fine. But then you see how good the stuff looks, like just bare, and you're just like, oh my God, like. All comics could look like this if we gave it a shot. I just finally found a copy of uh, Highest House Number 1, which is uh, Mike Carey and Peter Gross and Yuko Shimizu. And there Yuko like, integrated the logo into the illustration, and there's like nothing, like there's no credits or anything like that. And it's like oversized comic, and it's so gorgeous. It's aggressively gorgeous. It, it just like hits you. And I, to the point where like I'm holding it in my hand, and like... There's a part of me that doesn't even want to read it because when I read it, I'll, the experience will be over. So I'll just hold it in my hands and wait for the op- and flip through it and wait for the opportunity to read it. I'm, it it's the, the like, latest comic. That I'm just like, I, it, to me, so much of this stuff becomes digital. And one of the things, you know, comics is this really great place where it's a piece of art that you're holding in your hands and it's a story that you can kind of interact with. So you kind of want to fetishize that experience as much as possible, I feel like. And, and that's certainly like the, the point you know, when we're looking at the design of the book, it's just like something that just feels frail. And Highest House does that so well, like you're just holding it in your hand. And it reminds me when there used to be Criterion Collection uh, DVD sets. And sometimes you would want to like buy a movie you don't know anything about just because the design looks so cool, you know? And I just love that kind of experience. It's harder to find. Like the great thing about comic book stores is that unlike movies now or anything like that, like they haven't found a way to completely... And I don't think they'll ever find a way to completely replace that with digital. And so as a result, you can do this browsing thing. You can hold something in your hand to get seduced by how it looks and how it feels in your hands and like purchase it. And I think we're all of the age where we remember where that happened much more often in, on everything than we do now. And now it's all like, oh, that JPEG looks good. Let's click on it. Now, normally at this point in the show, I say, how can fans reach you? And I thought to myself, okay, there's Google. <laughs> and I write show notes. So in my show notes, I'm going to include all that information and no one's going to pull over to the side of the road or stop working out <laughs> or whatever. So yeah, I'll put all your contact information in the show notes. So if they want to follow you on Twitter or Facebook or learn more about you or the book, it will awesome. be in there. These are my fun questions for each of you. So porn sack, we'll start with you. Then Aaron, you next can answer. So Aaron, you have the advantage of hearing the question first and having a chance to think nice. about it. <laughs> <laughs> that does not sound fair at all. Okay. First one's easy. Porn sack, what do you like to do for rest and relaxation? It's been so long since I've rested and relaxed. I don't really know what that, what that answer is anymore. <laughs> I feel like I'm one of those people who like all their hobbies have kind of become work. I read comics. I watch movies. I watch TV. But like I'm also interested in like – but then sometimes you do all that stuff for research for the next thing, too. I don't know. I go on walks is what I do for rest and relaxation. I'm not good at taking a vacation. I'm not good at taking a break. I'm one of those people that when I'm in a relationship, my partner spends half the time trying to get me to not do work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm basically the same. Um, the only time I really rest is uh, if I'm hungover. Ah, nice. um, <laughs> And nice. then, uh, you know, my wife and I have a, you know, our weekend sort of ritual is that we stay in bed as long as possible in the morning. And I just sit and watch YouTube videos <laughs> and my wife like plays around on her phone. And, you know, we have a really one of those really nice beds that you can actually like almost like a hospital bed. You can like put it up into a sitting position. So we just kind of lounge for as long as we can. <laughs> but then I'm one of those people, I have way too many hobbies. I am an avid role-playing gamer. I run a weekly Dungeons & Dragons game that I am obsessive about. I am an avid woodworker, sort of an avid hobbyist. That's my second passion. I'm teaching myself you know, traditional woodworking, so like, I spend a lot of time with that. I love gardening, antiquing. Here's a good example of where I had to kind of clear my head. 
on Wednesday, I was getting this Twitter and Facebook barrage, unlike I have ever experienced in my entire life, of just like constant reviews coming out and podcasts coming out that I've done and like all of this stuff. Like I was starting to get like anxious and overloaded. I was starting to worry like about interviews I've done where I'm like, oh my God, do I sound like a jackass in these? And like, oh, I was getting like totally neurotic. And, like, I couldn't get any work done, so I was like, screw this. Like, I'm going to the antique store. And I just, like, left, and I just went, and I just, like, wandered around the antique mall for, like, an hour, and it, like, totally, like, centered me. (laughs) Just look at old stuff, you know, like. (laughs) It's so so funny you mention that, because I, in the past, like, month, I've had this, I've gotten into the habit of walking, taking a stroll down to the Salvation Army and going through all their used books. Being in New York, it's kind of a culture for used books because like you'll see a bookseller and you'll buy it. But I stopped buying used books here out in LA because by the time I drive to the used bookstore and parked, I've spent like, you know, money on gas, money on parking to buy a $3 book. Like it just doesn't make any sense. But I've discovered the Salvation Army that sells all these $2 books. And so the my little yeah. scroll, and you know, and it's a Salvation Army, so they don't have any organization whatsoever. So like once yeah. you find something, if you decide not to get it the next day, it might be there. It might be gone. Like who the hell knows where those things go? It's <laughs> yeah. all chaos over there. So that's now become my like little thing of just like, oh, this is how I'm gonna relax. I'm gonna go and that's like. That's so look funny. At I just went into the Salvation Army after I walked around the antique mall. There's yeah. a Salvation Army right yeah. behind it, and I was like, I'm gonna check out the Salvation oh, yeah. Army. And here they yeah. have furniture. And so yes. I went through there and like there wasn't anything, but I was like, I got to keep an eye on this because like <laughs> yeah. they actually have some like mid-century pieces. Like they're kind of cheap, but I was like, who knows what they're going to get in? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> it's a great place. I, I'm, I'm constantly like thrown by like how much like good stuff is in the Salvation Army. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it did smell weird, but. Um... <laughs> well, now that we've talked about relaxation and you're relaxed, okay. Okay. Close your eyes. Think back. Think back to a birthday that stands out in your memory. Got one? Uh, now, why did you pick that one? Was it a gift, a person that was there, a place you were? What birthday was that? Okay, so the first birthday that comes to mind was my 21st birthday because I – and which I technically, <laughs> Yeah, I technically don't remember that much. I remember the buildup to it a lot. Everyone was very excited to get me drunk. Everyone was very, very excited. And there was like a big barbecue over at my place. People were so excited to get me drunk. I was like, ooh, this doesn't feel like it's going to go well. So I was like procrastinating as much as I could. And then I got things to the point where they realized like, oh, my God, because we were living in Boston, there was only one hour left before the bars closed. And I was like, ha ha, I did it. Like, you know, like that's not enough time to get anything done. <laughs> and he like took me and threw me the car and they like went through red lights and all that and put me, and then next thing I know, it literally felt like next thing I know, there was a train of like seven shots in front of me. And they were like, all right, and everyone was changing, like drink, drink, drink. In very short amount of time, I feel like I was exploding all over that bar. <laughs> and before I was rushed to the bathroom. And then the next thing I remember is someone had kind of like taken to my room, put me to bed. I remember as I was sleeping, the sound of water being poured into a glass. And that was all I remember for my 21st birthday. But that is, <laughs> when I hear I think of memorable birthdays, that is, the, but especially the, the joy of like, I've outsmarted them all. There's no way they can get me sick and drunk in an hour. And I was so completely wrong by that. <laughs> Aaron, how about you? Oh God, my birthdays are all, pretty pathetic (laughs) just to compare to porn sack's 21st birthday i was the oldest among my friends and my birthday is in may it falls at just the right moment where i one of my good friends was actually like off of school (laughs) like he was like home from college at that point all my other friends college hadn't let out yet we just hung around we got we ended up meeting my sister at some block party that was mm-hmm. being hosted by a radio station in St. Louis, which was basically just like jocks and cheerleaders about ten years after they had graduated and nothing but Bud Light. And so we we wandered around that for like fifteen minutes and we were like, I, I can't drink Bud Light. I can't drink any more of this Bud Light. Like let's let's just go. And we left. We went to the gas station. I think I got a four pack of Guinness. And we went back to my house, and we sat in my kitchen, and me and my friend Jeff just sat there, and we drank four Guinnesses, and then called it a night. (laughs) (laughs) 
And then like a week later, the rest of my friends show up. But none of them are 21 yet. So it's like, uh, that was like the story of my life. I was always the oldest. Nothing could ever happen. My birthdays have always, I, I have a few. I mean, I can think back. I remember vividly. I can't remember exactly which birthday it was. But I remember, like, I think I was either seven or eight, maybe. And my parents rented out the McDonald's Play Place. But it was before it was called Play Place. It was just the McDonald's, like, playroom. They rented it out. My entire kindergarten class came. And we just played. But it's such a vague memory. I think, actually, the best birthday I had was my 35th. You know, it was just me and my wife and maybe a dozen friends at a local pub here in Albuquerque, a brewery here in Albuquerque. We had become fairly good friends with a food truck owner. Like over the months that we had become friends with him, he kind of saw us as as his like test kitchen. And so he would try out weird recipes and like just give it to us. And so we had him cater my 35th birthday and we were like, just do whatever you want. And he did, like, a whole, like, six-course thing for us for, like, next to nothing. And it was great. It was, that, that was, like, perfect. It was a beer, incredible food, and then, like, some good friends, and that was it. And so, yeah. But I've never had one of those, like, hangover moments. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. I'll actually combine the next two. You're looking around your bedroom when you were a youth. What is hanging on your wall what poster or picture and what music were you listening to what was on your turntable or walkman or ipod oh my god i have no idea the only thing that comes to mind right now it wasn't certainly the only thing on my wall but the only thing that comes to mind right now is they put out a midnight suns poster mm-hmm. ghost Rider had a spun off to its own little like mini universe and it was like Darkhold and Spirits of Vengeance and Morbius. And if you bought each one, then you got a little poster. And I think I got all of those and I put it up together on my wall for it to make a big poster. That definitely wasn't the only thing on my wall, but for whatever reason, it's the only thing I seem to remember right now. In terms of the music, I remember my music from college more than I remember music from Thailand. In Thailand, I went to high school in Thailand. So from seventh grade to end of high school, I was in Thailand. And it was around the time Thailand had very lax copyright laws. And so as a result, you could get albums to pretty much anything for like a dollar. And and they'd sell them on the streets. If the cops came, all of a sudden they'd rip it out of your hand, throw it on the cart, and they'd run away. Like it was one of those kind of operations. But there were tons of them and they were all over the place. And it wasn't until like my senior year of high school that they used to crack down on copyright laws in Thailand. And then as a result, Thailand got more movies. They would get like a month behind or sometimes like a couple of years behind for certain movies. Um, So as a result, I had just random, I had such random music. My first two concerts because of that, because I would go to concerts to literally any band that would come to America. My very first concert was like a Debbie Gibson concert. My very second concert, oh, it gets better. My very second concert, which was less than a year apart from my first concert, was a Metallica concert because those were the only tickets I could buy to things. So, so like, it was very much catch as catch can. <laughs> Aaron, how about you? Oh, man, I vividly remember my high school bedroom. It was my <laughs> refuge. Well, in addition to, like, tons of my own artwork that I had up on the walls, nice. which I still have to nice. this day, I've, I've been slowly, like, curating this, like, stack of my, like, terrible, like, comic drawings from then. I'm, like, slowly, like, I'm starting to show them on Facebook on Thursdays. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I had that, but I remember there was one wall that was dedicated to just comic stuff. So I had a poster and they were all, remember how Wizard Magazine used to have like those fold in oh, posters? Yeah. Here's the thing. I still have them. They're in a tube in my garage somewhere. I don't know why I still have them, but like, I remember when I was cleaning out my parents' place, there was like a whole stack of my stuff and there were all these tubes and I just grabbed them all and brought them over to my house. And as I remember pulling one out and I was like, what are these torn ruffled edges of this like very glossy paper? And I pulled it out. Oh my God, it's my pit poster and my profit poster. Oh wow. And, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. It's had a Wildcats poster. Nice. I had one of those poster like that you had to put together. You know, you had to buy like four months worth of wizard to get all four of them which I can't remember what that one was. 
I had a framed, mind you, a framed. I had my grandfather, who was a carpenter. I had my grandfather for a birthday or Christmas present, like actually build me a frame for a photograph of Liechtenstein, the wow. castle in Berlin. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> the castle in Germany? Or no, it wasn't Liechtenstein. It was um that's that fairy tale castle that you always see pictures of. The Walt Disney Castle was based on. Oh, okay. And uh uh so there was there was a poster of that. This one followed me around from uh middle school. I had a poster of a red Lamborghini Countach because <laughs> I was I was obsessed with Lamborghinis for a while, nice. and uh, <laughs> nice. every inch of wall space was covered with some kind of comic-related poster <laughs> or, like, like something fairy tale ish like the castle or, <laughs> you know, all of my, like, little pipe dreams that I had as a, as a middle schooler and a high schooler. And then as far as the music I listened to... That's kind of embarrassing. It, that was like all over the place. I loved White Zombie, so I had like a lot of White Zombie and like Slayer and uh, Pantera, but then also Inya and uh, Enigma and nice. uh, REM and uh, oh, uh, of course, uh, Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, Melancholy and Infinite Sadness was something that I listened to like over and over and over mm -hmm. again. There was like a handful of like Simon and Garfunkel songs that I listened to over and over again. And then there was like a couple Partridge Family songs that I had like that I listened to all the time. <laughs> like nice. weird nice. stuff, like just weird kind of random stuff. You know, all of the influences I had from my friends were mostly heavy metal. I sadly have to admit that I was a huge Dave Matthews fan <laughs> and, <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and I like it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With creative types, that's always the case where they have a wide range of tastes. You just can't. Ha you have to. You have to have that. Yeah. yeah there's definitely yeah. something to do that. <laughs> now, this is one of my favorite questions. If you were stuck on a deserted island, it can only have one book that either you want to read or one that you like to read over and over again every year. What would that one book be? Oh, I know that's, it is, it's the book that probably had the biggest influence on me, Grace Paley's Collected Stories. So uh, Grace Paley, one of my biggest influences as a writer, the thing about her was that she started off as a poet, she became a short story writer, and she always wanted to be a novelist and she couldn't write a novel. But then in trying to write a novel, she'd write these like this wonderful collection of short stories. And I want to say there's only like three books out that she has. There's one that was this collection of short stories and that collects three different collections that she had had, but they collected all in one and a book of her essays and maybe a book of her poems. And that's it. I remember being like, it's so crazy about her because you can take her whole career and just put it in a book. And my professor said, yeah, but you don't need anything else. And he's like, yeah, you're kind of right. And I love that collection of short stories so much that by the time I got to the equivalent of the third collection, I made the, the decision to jump around and read the stories out of order because that way I could fool myself into thinking I wasn't running out of stories. So to this day, I still don't know if I've read all the stories in that book because I will never read them in order. But her writing had such an influence on me. It was so lyrical. There's a story that she has called uh, Faith in a Tree, and it's about a woman, one of her ongoing characters, the name of Faith, and she's just sitting in a tree. And she's looking, from that tree, she can see everyone in her neighborhood. And she tells all these stories about the different people in her neighborhood. And it ends when this uh, protest march walks into the neighborhood and disrupts sort of everything. And it becomes this awakening for the character that, like, that no matter where you go, politics will follow you. And the reason to get into politics is because it affects your family one way or another. And to me, it was one of the best stories I'd ever read about a political awakening. And, and, and that's the thing about Paley. Paley was a political activist, and she was this beautiful writer and a professor at Princeton at the time. Those stories had such a huge impact uh, on me. And so I would, I, I would have that on my side. <laughs> See, I have to take issue with that, though, porn sack, because you're on a desert island, and politics no longer matter. But the stories are still so good. <laughs> the stories are still so good. <laughs> <laughs> like even there alone in the desert island yeah, yeah, yeah. you'll never see another human you're still <laughs> obsessed with the proletariat <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah they're, they're too good they're too good not to be obsessed with I, I i stand by my answer i stand by my answer 
Okay. Aaron, how about you? For many, many, many years, it would have been Lord of the Rings, but um, this point in my life, it would have to be the collected works of H.P. Lovecraft. In the past 10 years, I've become like utterly obsessed with his work. Anything that I can consume that kind of deals with those stories and analyzes them or dissects them or just has fun with them, I can't get enough of it anymore. I like even though there's like incredibly problematic things about the man, the work is it's so resonant. It, it stays contemporary no matter how you look at it. Obviously, the horror Red Hook is one that I might tear out and leave it behind. But, you know, like so much of like his quintessential works, every time I read them, I find some new way to be kind of terrified by them. As you grow older and you start dealing with issues of mortality more and more, uh, you start to see how much of that was an influencer of that work how he dealt with the unknown and the unknowable, a really incredible grasp of sort of like the human condition. It informed a lot of the work on Infidel, to tell you the truth, because, you know, Lovecraft, he was fairly bigoted and racist throughout his entire life. He kind of cooled towards the end of his life and kind of opened up. But these are the places where you can find like anyone can find commonalities or or, like common ground in that work, because at its core, racism is about fear of the unknown. It is about fear of the other. And, you know, I'm used to my safe little world and there's something that's coming in and disrupting that safe little world. And what the hell am I supposed to do now? If you really delve in deep, it's enough to keep your mind burning forever, really, with those questions. If you attack it, if you really approach it from a critical perspective, you can kind of tear out of it what you need to try to answer those questions or or at least deal with those questions. So definitely Lovecraft. And, you know, what better way to be terrified on a desert island than with the story of, you know, extra planar, extra dimensional, you know, horror or you're on a desert island, there's the ocean, yeah. Cthulhu could rise up at yeah. any moment. <laughs> yeah, I know. I certainly have to take issue with that. Like, being on a desert island isn't bad enough. Now you're going to terrify yourself. Well, well that's like, the thing, though. You're on a desert island, and you read a Lovecraft story, and you're like, well, I guess it could be worse. <laughs> yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you could also think it could get worse any second now, too, because of that Lovecraft yeah. collection. Yeah, because what? You take a copy of Eat, Pray, Love, and then you just yearn for, like, <laughs> I don't know, like, cuddly crap like that you'll never have talk about like sadomasochist i like, actually love the idea of like the most torturous desert island so like you go to the desert island and there are just like cookbooks like all over like like just like <laughs> poor books all over oh my god island. that would be an amazing like short graphic novel <laughs> like desert island and it's just cookbooks yeah yeah or it's like, only coconuts yeah yeah, yeah. or, or with, with that there's that like cooking show that like show on netflix where like all that with all those great restaurants center kitchen or something like that and mm-hmm. it's just like ipad playing center kitchen like you know when you're in the middle of like, the desert island <laughs> that's awesome i love that it's awesome <laughs> now if you think that's crazy here's one for you if a toy company were to make an action figure of you, what would be your accessory? Oh, jeez. If it's going to be an action figure of me, what would be the accessories? My glasses would probably be part of the figure, so that probably was, doesn't count as an accessory. God, this is so boring, but I probably, my laptop would probably be the accessory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's Maybe. nothing else that I really <laughs> have. All right. <laughs> It's okay, well, really mine would have... action figure. If we would take the action out of the, it would just be a figure. <laughs> it's just a figure. <laughs> figure. A a a sedent, It would be like a, a new line of sedentary figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> TV remote. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. totally. I thought it'd be a laptop, TV remote. What else? <laughs> Maybe like a Swiffer. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, just like, like a like a, a razor to shave with, <laughs> right, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> the most boring thing. It would just I, be the things in your apartment. 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, one of the things that I, just to show how boring my life is, I realized as of a couple of years ago, I've stopped having dreams. Like one, I don't remember dreams anymore. I, I either don't have them or don't really remember them. But the few, 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 few times I have dreams now, they're the most boring dreams. They're like, I went to the office. I saw something in a drawer. Like, I don't like, and I'll hear people dream like, oh, I was flying. I was in a cab. I'm like, I like find paper clips in my, like, this is how boring my life has become. That even my dreams, it's just like, ooh, I had a great meeting on productivity today. <laughs> you, you, you come with a whiteboard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it'd be more like an eraser. You'd have to get, like, the whiteboard would be the separate thing you'd buy on the side. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would definitely have two beards that you could, nice. you could interchange. The uh, winter garden, as I term it, my winter beard, <laughs> and then my, uh, my, 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 <laughs> Oh, oh no! It would be my winter garden, and then it would just be like your standard summer beard. But then for summer beard time, it would come with a little beard buddy, and beard buddies. So this is something I don't do anymore. Like up until this year, because this year I, I decided I need to be an adult human person <laughs> and go to a barber and <laughs> have like an actual like person who's trained to do this take care of this crap. And, and but before what I would do, I'd stop trimming my beard first day of fall. And I wouldn't touch my beard until the first day of spring. And so then first day of spring comes, I'd put a rubber band around my beard, make a ponytail as big as I could, and then just cut it off. And then I would make these little troll dolls out of the beard. <laughs> oh, and, my God. That's yeah, so yeah. creepy. That's I so know. creepy. That, that's the point. That's the, that's the entire point. And then I give it to, like, friends. No. Like, weird <laughs> presents. <laughs> Like, they'd open it up or, or whatever, and there'd just be that weird moment of them <laughs> looking at this thing, wondering, what is this thing? And then I'd be like, that's my beard. <laughs> that's your beard, bud. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I, I stopped doing that because, you know, you go to a barber and, you know, they're not going to take part in that awfulness. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so I did, definitely there'd be two beards and a beard buddy. And then, uh, uh sh- Oh, man. I mean, do I want to be trite and say art supplies? Or <laughs> it would probably be like a weird collection of like there'd be a handsaw, like a little garden hoe, and then like maybe some paintbrushes and stuff. So you're like, what am I supposed to do with all of this? This is just a weird collection of things that don't go together. <laughs> That's awesome. And okay. definitely Dungeons and Dragons Players Handbook would be in there. <laughs> to play with. <laughs> yeah, and then a couple Wait. dice. <laughs> For each of you, what would be your beverage of choice when you're resting and relaxing? I cannot survive without a steady stream of Diet Coke at all times. I, it's less about if I'm resting or relaxing and more just like living. I just kind of need like that as a like part of my day. I'm sure it would involve that somehow. It's a very boring answer because I don't really drink that much. But that Diet Coke gets me through. The, I also don't drink coffee. So that Diet Coke it literally gets me through the day. For me, like if I'm going to go Druthers, if I'm going to have my Druthers mm. route, then it would definitely be some scotch. I'm not like snobbish i don't need i mean all scotch is expensive it's a luxury um no matter what scotch i get i don't need like a 150 fifty dollar bottle of scotch but just like a, a good decent scotch if i could that's where i'd always go final question out of all the interviews you've done what question have you never been asked that you want to be asked something people don't know about you but you wish they did and we already know about beard buddies so that doesn't count <laughs> <laughs> before this interview i would say the fact that my first two concerts were debbie gibson and metallica like i've definitely never come up in an interview now after that i don't desperately want people to know anything about me um <laughs> no one's asked me this during an interview but lord knows i volunteer my opinion on this any opportunity i get one of my pet peeves is that living in la people we were talking about hikes earlier and like when Aaron goes on a hike, that's a proper hike. In LA, people go on hikes where they've got like makeup on, they're wearing sneakers, those 
the trail is paved and it drives me up the wall because people were here would just be kind of like, do you like hiking? And I'm like, hiking in LA is just walking with hills. Like that's all that is. And yet people feel they need to get dressed up in all these outfits in order to do it. And it just drives me crazy. So I'll go like on a hike with a friend and be like, you're wearing jeans and a t-shirt. I'm like, yeah, that's how I walk. I don't need to have like special clothes to walk. But apparently in L.A., that's a thing that they do. And to me, a hike is like you go out and you need like boots and you need like proper wear. And you maybe want to pack a, like a little protein thing on the side because you're going to be go away for a while. And the hiking that they do out here where it's just walking, all they're doing is walking, but there are trees around them. And they decide to call that a hike. And it drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that is the question I wish someone would ask me so I could go on that rant. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have an excuse to go on that rant. I love eating sushi. I don't come up with a new word for eating just because I like eating sushi. I don't say, hey, let's sushi today. That's not a thing. People in L.A., don't like to walk, so they'll call it hiking to make it seem like they're doing something special. <laughs> and porn sack continues to alienate the LA. Audience. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. This, this is the rant I go to every time. By the way, someone asks me, "Oh, do you like to hike?" I'm like, "Let me tell you something." <laughs> porn sack is the quintessential anti-LA New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> I was visiting my sister in like San Diego, and I I have a lot of jackets now, but only just wear one. It's like this leather jacket that I have, and it's San Diego, so everyone's in like shorts and like sweatshirts. And my sister just looked at me. It's like it's like as if Central Casting wanted a New Yorker to be in like in this scene somehow. Like you don't need to wear a leather jacket. It's San Diego. Aaron, how about you? Is there a question that you want to be asked that you haven't been asked yet? You actually asked one of them what we do when we're not like doing. <laughs> when we're not, we're not, when we're not doing comics, what do you do? And I, I never get asked that, which is fine. You know, like I have my inner life that I lead and, you know, that's not necessarily anyone's business. There are aspects of myself that are very Ron Swanson. Somebody asked me like, what's your religion? I'm like, it's my religion is none of your goddamn business. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like my, my ideology, like it's none of your business. Oh man. You know, you could ask me, why do you love England so much? I could talk about England forever because I love England. I, I've been to England two times now. I've spent a month and a half there at this point, and I can't get enough of it. But then also, I think maybe maybe like a, a more poignant question would be, if you could go back, what would you do different? Like That's something I think a lot about now, what I might do different if I knew everything that I knew now. Especially if I knew everything I knew up until just before Jose asked me to be a part of Infidel. <laughs> <laughs> Infidel very much revitalized my love of the comic genre. Because I had gotten to a point in my career where I was like, what am I doing? I don't feel like I'm going anywhere. All I'm really doing is just exhausting myself to an extreme to an early grave. It's not even a joke. You know, my father died of brain cancer three and a half years ago. Obviously a huge turning point in my life because he was 64 years old. He's 24 years older than I am right now. I started asking myself really intense questions about what am I doing? Where am I going with this? How much time do I really have left? Because they say brain cancer is not hereditary, but my father's first cousin, Gary, who was his best friend growing up, also died of brain cancer. And then there is a, a litany of other cancer cases in my family, which we all have theories for why. Like that's something that exists. Suddenly it was in the back of my head. Basically, I went from somebody who did not even consider his health on any level. I was like, I'm a healthy guy, do what I want, and I'm fine, to, like, every weird pain that I had, I was like, this means something deeper. I was like, oh, I would get, like, a, a weird little muscle pain on the side of my arm or, like, my pectoral muscle. And I'd be like, oh, my God, this, like, a heart attack coming? I became so paranoid of having a heart attack that I ended up going to cardiologists and doing, like, tests, the run tests and everything. 
because I was so like freaked out. I, w- I became a complete hypochondriac, basically. And so then that basically like came right into my comic work where I was like, like, what am I doing? And so like I went on hiatus and I started doing fine art painting and whatever. And then I came back and Infidel, like I said, Infidel has basically righted the ship. Like the ship is back on course. And like, I feel like I'm achieving something worthwhile. I have very strong opinions about a lot of different topics. I often tell people every gray hair in my beard represents something I disapprove of. (laughs) (laughs) That's one of those questions I've been kind of struggling with recently. Like, I wish I had two more lifetimes to live because there's so many other things that I would love to be able to become a master of. The woodworking, there is, I I don't know why, it obviously has a lot to do with my familial history coming from a long line of carpenters and blacksmiths and things like that. There's something about working wood for me that deeply resonates with me. The idea of like, you use your hands, and it's similar to art, but with art, there's this whole mental component that you have to like kind of always be on stage whenever you're creating a illustration or a painted piece. When you're working wood, there's this moment where you where you leave yourself and you just kind of it becomes very zen. You just kind of exist as you make shavings, you know, with your plane. And there's this connection that you have through the wood to nature. And there's parts of me where I think, like, if I could go back right now, would I change everything? Would I decide, like, shit, I'm going to I'm gonna try to find a, a, an apprenticeship somewhere and become a woodworker? If I could go back right now, I don't know if I would stay with comics. I don't know if I'd take that same path. I might, I might go somewhere completely different. I, I'm just not sure anymore. But at the same time, like I said, this is all things that I was thinking about until Jose messaged me out of the blue on Facebook and said, hey, I got this thing. And suddenly everything's changed now. And now like, I'm very happy to keep the woodworking and all this other stuff, these hobbies that I'm very obsessed with, but exist there to kind of like uh, refocus myself for the comic page. I want to start writing. I, I, like, there's all this stuff I want to do now, you know? <laughs> it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because like, like, I never know how to answer that question because I, I've been under this kick very much recently in these past few months about how, like, someone had told me this idea of, like, oh, rejection is God's protection kind of thing. And even though I'm somewhat atheist or maybe agnostic is the better way to say it, I do think there's a lot to that. There is a lot to the, these things that you don't do, whatever you sort of believe in, things that I thought were disappointments. If they had happened, Infidel would not exist. And I'm so happy about this experience. How can I be sad that I didn't get that job or that I didn't do that or anything like that? It's funny how I feel like how that works. This is speaking from a very privileged position of where like things work out. Yeah. And because of that, it's easy to look back and say like every failure that happened in the past has led to this moment. Yeah. And even though this moment has come midlife and there's other individuals who struck lightning right from the start it's still like everything led to this moment it's hard to go back and say what would i change when all of those other experiences are necessary to get to here yeah like albuquerque has a has had an explosion of its homeless population in recent years and any intersection you go to in the city there's going to be at least one panhandler in that intersection And you look at that person, and most of these people are probably in their late 50s and 60s. You think, how awful. Like, you empathize with this person and think how horrible that must be to have no hope. And this is all you have, is sitting with a piece of cardboard at an intersection, hoping someone gives you a dollar so you can make it through the next day. And that's where these kind of ideas for me start to break down where it's like, Oh, everything, all my failures led to this for that guy. Yeah. All his failures led to that. Yeah. To him sitting on a street corner. That's one of the difficult things that, that you struggle with where you almost start to feel guilty about. Yeah. My wife and I talk about this a lot. You You start to feel guilty about success because like what separates me, like what weird misfortune separates me from this person who is a veteran you know, who fought in wars and is now completely forgotten. And this is all they can do. 
So, sorry to be a bummer, guys. <laughs> no. For a second, Aaron, I can't thank you enough. This has been a great conversation. I look forward to see where this series is going, and I look forward to everything you guys do, and just keep on keeping on. Thanks, man. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much. This is like the best interview I've ever done. These yeah, questions you great. did at the end were were great. <laughs> like th- this is like like th- that. That's I-, I wish I could just do podcasts which just like that. It'd be like, <laughs> here's a person you know. <laughs> screw what they do. We're just gonna talk about random stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, and I wish you both the best of luck. And thank you so much for being on Creator Talks. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the invitation. Next week, my guest on Creator Talks will be Mike Barron. Mike Barron is the co-creator and writer of Nexus. He is also the creator and writer of Badger, which was published by First Comics back in the 80s and returned recently. He has also written Marvel's Punisher, Punisher War Journal, DC Comics' Dead Man, Batman, and The Flash, and also has written Star Wars comics for Dark Horse Publishing. Please join me next week for the Bloody Red Baron experience. Thank you for joining me for Creator Talks this week. The show is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, and also on Amazon Echo and Dot devices. Just say, Alexa, play podcast Creator Talks to hear the latest episode. In addition, you can listen to the show and follow it through Podbean. Your feedback is greatly appreciated, so please rate and review on iTunes if you like the show or an episode that you heard. Your ratings and reviews go a long way to helping the show, and I can't thank you enough for taking a bit of time to do that. For your convenience, in the show notes of each podcast, I have a link to my iTunes page where you can rate and review the show and see the entire list of shows available. If you haven't heard them all, take a look through. There are living legends and -and up-and-coming comic creators. Tell family and friends who like comics and comic book creators about the show. And to subscribe. The content is free. Just as valued are your comments and feedback. You can reach me through Facebook and Twitter at Creator Talks Pod. That's at Creator Talks Pod. You can also reach out to me by email. You can find that at my website, CreatorTalks.com. At the website, you will also find blog posts, reviews of books that I have read that you might want to read too, my catalog of podcasts, and videos and other written articles on the website, CreatorTalks.com. A hearty thank you to all my guests. It is an honor and a privilege for you to make time to be on the show and talk to me about your work. It is your knowledge and insight into the creative process that makes the show so unique. My thanks also goes out to my family who makes this show possible, especially my executive co-producer, Mrs. Calloway. I'll be back each and every Thursday with a new interview. For Creator Talks, I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. Until next time. <laughs>